All right, everyone, on today's episode, we are getting the opportunity to speak with an anonymous blogger. Now, I, I say this to say that I think there have been so few anonymous bloggers that we have interviewed recently, I've forgotten some of the advantages of being an anonymous blogger. And one of them is the radical transparency. That, that what we are, we're actually today, we're going to be speaking with a Purple Life, writes over to purplelife.com. And she, because through the freedom of anonymity, has documented every single expense, every single salary negotiation that she made. Her net worth projections, her, her net worth on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis, and has put it all out there for the community. And I know that the community has soaked it up and it's been refreshing to see it. So as you listen to this episode, realize the only thing you're not getting is her actual first name. I mean, that's incredible. And so I just want you to appreciate the fact that it's actually hard to get someone to come on and share this level of information with you because there's a privacy aspects to this, you know, especially if you're pursuing this goal of early retirement while working in a job. What does it mean if you say, I'm going to retire and leave my job at the age of 30 and you're doing this publicly and your employer finds out how does that affect it? How does it affect it when your employer has to figure out who they're giving that next raise to? Just think about that and appreciate how valuable this anonymity is in the context of this conversation. Very excited to find out more about her story. To help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And yeah, you're absolutely right. That radical transparency, it, it is refreshing. It really, truly is. I cannot think, really, in recent memory of our ability to dive into the nuts and bolts of the numbers like that. And I'm, I'm really just selfishly excited to learn more about Purple, learn more about her story, this amazing amazing path she's been on. And with that, a purple life. Welcome to Choose a Fine. Hi, thank you. So happy to be here. So I did kind of put it all out there, radical transparency. I guess I should back (laughs) up a step and say, is anything off limits? Mm, No, not in my life. All right, let's go for it. So uh, let me just do a little bit more of a setup that I didn't get to in the intro. Uh, You had this aggressive goal of retiring at the age of 30, which coincided with year 2020. If you guys have looked at a calendar recently, you'll notice that 2020 is coming upon us. And so we are getting very close. And it it looks like actually, if anything, she's doing better than her projected target. In fact, that date keeps on moving up. I think it started at 35. Now it's I'll retire at 30, in fact. So what allowed her to do this? Well, in part, it was what some people may consider extreme frugality and domestic geo arbitrage and salary negotiation. Does that sound like something that you could use? Could you use a little bit of that in your life? I think I know I could. And so I'm very excited for this. So purple again, where, like where, where does this story start? Did you, did you, did you know, as soon as you got into college that you were going to be pursuing financial independence? I did not. Embarrassingly, I was the stereotypical partner that didn't listen to uh, my boyfriend at the time when he introduced me to the idea of financial independence. I was resistant to it for about two years, and then it finally clicked for me, and then I dove in and actually surpassed his enthusiasm, and now I'm barreling down this path. (laughs) Nice. So what does that look like when he first approaches you with, oh, I found this amazing world of financial independence? What, What did you think that very first time? I was completely resistant to it. He sent me um, the subreddit personal finance and then financial independence, which led me to the normal path, Mr. Money Mustache, which then said that he was going to punch me in the face for spending a lot of money, which I wasn't very uh, open to. (laughs) So it might have just been the wrong initial blog for me. I was like, oh, I don't want to be deprived. I don't want to have to think about this stuff so much. I'm fine. My mom retired at 55. My my grandma retired at 50. Like that's a fine trajectory. Why why would I try harder now? I'm only 25, 23 at the time. So that was the entire thing. I just ignored him. What changed? I was telling myself that if I got this dream job and I had, of course, some very organized person. So I had an entire list of what I wanted that dream job to entail. Um, it had to have anonymity, a boss that really actually cared, a mission that I was going towards building something challenge. And I told myself, oh no, it's just that I haven't found that job. And when I get that, I'll be quote unquote happy. And so I will not be upset to get up early every weekday. I will be happy to go into work forever until 55. That was still my vague goal based on my mom. I got that job and I still didn't want to keep doing it. So I had to think of another plan. And through analyzing my spending, job hopping, increasing my salary, and realizing that a lot of my preferences and the ways they differ from my mom, for example, she owns 
a house and a rental house and cars and um, has multiple children. I have none of those things by choice. So that really accelerated my journey. And I just applied what she'd already taught me. And it seems to be heading me towards retiring at 30. So I really want to, I actually want to go into each one of these details and you can do multiple things at once, but I suspect you didn't do everything at once. You started somewhere. So when you decided, okay, I can speed this up. I can start working toward this. What was that goal? You know, was it 30, you know, I want to retire at 30 immediately, or did you work towards that? And then where did you really start? I started with analyzing my spending and you're completely right. I do everything in stages. I usually have a year at a time where I really focused on one thing. So at the beginning, I focused on my spending. I said, do I really need all of these things? I was living in Manhattan at the time. So I actually wasn't able to decrease my spending much because the largest expense was Manhattan rent. Um, so I did what I could. I taught myself to cook. I, so I started going out to restaurants less. I changed my phone plan from a $100 a month AT&T plan on an iPhone to Republic Wireless for $15 a month. And I had the same service. I was like, why? what, did, what was I doing before? <laughs> uh, just little things like that. And then when we finally decided, actually, I think Manhattan might not be for us long term. I was able to tackle that largest expense, which led us to Seattle. Since you were looking at the data back in New York, what did your life cost before you started tracking your spending in, in New York specifically? And then after you started to optimize these various things, what was your steady state in New York? I did not track my spending that closely, but it looks like I was spending about 35K. And then after moving to Seattle, I spend about 18 and I'm projecting 20 in retirement. Okay. Now this is very interesting. I'm curious how you picked Seattle. Cause some people might say, all right, New York's expensive. Seattle's expensive. And you know, there's plenty of options in between, especially if you're working remote. How did you, you know, and maybe you're not working remote, but how did you end up landing on Seattle? We are real nerds and we made a spreadsheet of all possible cities that we could move to. And some of the variables were cost of living versus the salary that I could command in different parts of the country. I'm in marketing. So for example, San Diego was on our list, but they don't have a lot of ad agencies or large marketing clients. So that wouldn't have worked out very well. Um, also the access to public transit. I grew up in Atlanta and I'm so over cars. I don't want to own a car. <laughs> so um, access to that really matters. And um, general things like weather, feel of the city, that kind of stuff. So when we put all those variables together, Seattle came out on top because it has about half the cost of living, but the same salaries because of the tech giants that are here. And that's how we chose it. Yeah, no, that certainly that certainly makes sense. I'm curious. A, a lot of people are interested in in moving, right? They're listening to this podcast. They're thinking about financial independence. Maybe domestic geo arbitrage is, is on the table for them. But I think getting that job is the stumbling point. I'm curious, did you find your job, or I guess both of you, did you find jobs in Seattle before you moved? Was this, hey, we're going to move and just kind of hope we find jobs? Like, how, how did that work for you? Well, to be honest, I was terrified. Um, <laughs> I was about to leave that quote unquote dream job that I had to move across the country to a city my partner had never even visited. And I was very worried about finding a job. I'd been told by many people I should just move there and then it would be a lot easier to find one. So that was my backup plan. But actually, I got very lucky in that I applied to a job online and this is the first time it's ever happened. I actually got that job without ever having met the people or flown to Seattle or anything. Usually all my jobs are through networking, but that time I actually went to a portal and they responded. Wow. Now that's really interesting. Now, I want to circle back to the the job search and the salary negotiation because I know that's a, the part of your story, but I actually first want to discuss uh, the the spin less. So, you know, we, we have these options on the path to financial independence and just for our audience to set a frame for why we're tackling these in the way we are. You can earn more, you can spend less, and or you can invest better, invest the difference. We want to grow this gap, right? Earn what, what you earn minus what you spend is equal to this gap. What does it look like to grow that and do better investing that gap? And in your case, we've talked about how this move from New York to Seattle was able to drastically uh, decrease the cost of your living down from 35, I believe I heard you say in passing, down to $18,000 a year. Like what, what does that look like? Now, I know you're just talking about the cost for yourself as a single individual. What, what makes up $18,000 a year in expenses and how is that not deprivation? I, I mean, I, I asked that not from like a putting that on you, but more just from an audience's perspective. Like 
is $18,000 a year really a really something that I could live off of? Like help place us, like how you came up with this number of happiness at 18K. So it's funny you say that because the difference, basically $18,000, the only change is that I moved from Manhattan to Seattle as in my rent. That was, that's the difference in rent between those two places. Um, and that was really it besides those little things that I optimized, but I wasn't looking to change anything if it decreased my standard of living. For example, the phone plan, absolutely no change to my life, thousands of dollars of savings. Um, so that was it. I actually, we have a much nicer apartment in Seattle than we ever did in New York. And it costs less than half. Um, I walk to work when in New York, I was pushing my way onto the subway train every day and spending $120 a month to do so. So my life has actually improved while my spending has been cut almost in half. Can we actually go through the line items that make up $18,000 a year in expenses? We can. Let me pull them up real quick. And yeah, just to set the frame, I mean, this is $1,500 a month. That's what $18,000 a year works out to. So yeah, $1,500 a month is roughly what we're trying to get at. So yeah, we'd love to hear just how that breaks down. All right. So in general, my rent in Seattle is about 850 bucks a month, including rental insurance. Then, as I mentioned, my phone plan is with Republic Wireless, and I actually changed to a fancier plan. It went up to $25. <laughs> More data. More data, right? Um, but now actually I'm on the annual plan this year, so it'll be 20 bucks a month. Very important $5 savings. <laughs> <laughs> um we split our internet bill. So for me, it's about 25 bucks, electric, 20 bucks. We pay for water, sewer, and gas, which is about 30 bucks a month. I set aside $15 a month for transit buses or Ubers or Lyfts if I'm not feeling like walking. I absolutely love walking. And um, now that I use JobSpotter, I love it even more since I get paid to walk. We'll come back to yeah, that, oh, obviously. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> How do we not stop right there? Holy no, God. no, no. Let's keep going. Let's, <laughs> let's finish this train of thought first. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So those are my pretty much set expenses. Um, and that comes out to like mm, 950-ish per month. And then the rest is things like groceries. I spend about $125 a month on those, even though I eat a lot of meat on keto. Um, eating out about... 50 bucks a month. And that's going out multiple times. It's not just, oh, I'm only allowed to leave the house and go out once. Um, alcohol, about 50 bucks. That's for going out to happy hours with my friends. Um, I also set aside some money to bring wine or snacks or stuff like that over to friend's house. That's about 20 bucks a month. And then everything else is um, kind of rainy day expenses, as YNAB calls it. Uh, buying toilet paper, you know, hair dye, <laughs> since I'm Gotta a little obsessed hair with purple, purple hair. Apparently I spent 20 bucks last year on clothes total. That's good to know. I have some entertainment costs. I love to go see movies. My medical expenses are pretty low. That's one of the reasons I'm increasing my projection to 20K in retirement, because right now my company pays for a lot of it. Okay. So I was actually going to ask you about that. Yes. I did. Mm -hmm. One of the structural expenses, many people are wondering about the cost of healthcare and it didn't notice that there. So the company mm -hmm. picks up 90 plus percent of the healthcare premium at this point. Is that fair? Basically, which is why I'm saying more 20 K since I will, I've projected what I'll need to spend on that. I'm planning to be basically a nomad and get expat insurance. I'm projecting um, it to be like $2,000, but when I've actually looked at the plans, it's around 1000 to 1500 a year. Okay. All right. So, and what's interesting is I could also see many people like listening to some of these numbers and saying, well, I could see myself doing that for a month, but life is lumpy, right? That's another thing YNAB says. Well, life is lumpy. So like, does this hold true when you actually look at averages in YNAB over three, four, six months? Like that is actually what your steady state life cost? Yep. I was just looking at my averages from 2018 all up. So that does work. Um, of course, life is lumpy. You're totally right. Sometimes I'm dropping a thousand bucks on a plane ticket and sometimes I'm staying at home and reading. So it all averages out. And I know that you're a fan of travel rewards. So in many cases, you can get much of the travel for far less than it, individuals would normally assume. So you can still have your travel life built in there. And the other thing that I that I wanted to ask about and follow up on was actually your grocery bill. So it was interesting to me that you said you spent, and this is for you as an individual, you spent $125 a month on groceries. Now I was kind of expecting next to that you to say that you eat kind of a, a beans and rice type diet or, or some such. You know, I, what I was not expecting you to say is that you follow a keto diet, which is heavy on meat. And particularly the two meats, steak and salmon, uh, <laughs> tend to be $5.99, $6.99 a pound up. 
Uh, and that's an inexpensive place. In Seattle, I expect it to be even more. So how do you are how are you able to maintain that type of diet for $125 a month? I shop sales. Usually they dictate what I'm eating. So if steak has gone on sale for $3 a pound, I load up, I fill our freezer with it. And then we're obsessed with sous vide food. So we just pop it out of the freezer, put it in the sous vide, and then we eat really cheap but delicious steak. And that has actually really helped my restaurant budget decrease significantly. When I was in New York, and even when we came to Seattle, I was still spending about $250 a month on restaurants. But since I discovered sous vide and went keto, it's just plummeted because I can make better food at home. <laughs> wow. So I've been on this Instapot kick this whole time, Brad. And now, look, yeah. I've been going in the wrong direction. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> learn something new every day. So I wanted to ask about city living. I know when we had Liz from Frugal Woods on back, way back when, she talked about how most people have this, this idea that living in a city is extraordinarily expensive. But she turned that on its head and said, there are free activities everywhere. And most of the time, you can walk places. You don't need a car. And, and I'm struck looking at your budget that that seems to be the life you're living. I'd love for you to talk through the benefits of city living while pursuing fine. I think city living, it's obviously necessary for me to be near my job. Even though I do work remote, I'm in client service. So at times I do need to go in and talk to clients and be face to face. Um, but I completely agree. There is so much to do for completely free. It's all walkable. Just walking around a city, I find, is a wonderful activity, <laughs> which of course, if you're in a more rural area, walking in the woods could be also very wonderful. But there's always something cheap or free to do. For example, I love, I mentioned happy hours really quickly. There's always some place to get a $3 glass of wine. <laughs> There's always a way to find a place that will give us a bucket of nachos for $5. <laughs> There's always choices that a city provides when if you're in a more rural area, there's less choice. And I would imagine it gets a little more expensive because they have that kind of monopoly. So I actually want to come back and talk about job spotter. So it's one thing to not have a car, not pay for all the costs that are associated with having a car, maintaining a car, paying for car insurance, et cetera, et cetera, taxes. But it's another thing to get paid to walk to work. And uh, that's not something you hear people talk about very often. So I'd love to find out more. Sure. I am obsessed with this app. It is indeed called job spotter and it is it was created by Indeed.com and they pay you to take pictures of hiring signs. And the idea is that you take pictures of more mom and pop signs that they can't actually afford to pay Indeed to list. So you're helping people find jobs. That's how Indeed also pays you. And it's super fun. It's like a scavenger hunt. And I've been telling everyone about it, even though they're like, don't say that there's more competition. I don't care. This is <laughs> <laughs> the most fun I've had in a long time. Um, just searching for hiring signs. I pay more attention on my walks. I've been at the same job for about three years. So I've been walking the same route, but now I'm, my eyes are open. I'm seeing new things. And so I just think it's the most fun ever and I get paid. <laughs> that is wild. I've never heard of anything like that. So are you assigned to like a particular area or if you went to on a trip to Paris and you saw a help wanted sign, would you be able to take a picture of it and geolocate it and, and get paid for that? Like uh, maybe that's an extreme example, but no, if you, you were would. in New York or Miami or wherever it may be. <laughs> she said, yeah. No, oh, you're wow. completely right. If I, sorry, if I go to Paris, I would get paid to, if I can recognize a help wanted sign in French, my French is rusty. Wow. This is incredible. So let's talk about like what sort of, what sort of month, what's your average monthly revenue that you've generated from just doing this walk? You're walking to work every day. You've made sure that every single job on your walk to work has been filled. Thanks to your good efforts. You made the world a better, more employed, more employed place. How much have they compensated you for this? So not much between 20 and $30, but I caveat that with, I don't go out of my way to job spot. So this is literally, if I'm already walking somewhere and I see a job sign, I take a picture to contrast that my friend, Michelle at frugality and freedom has made 80 bucks in one day before. So if you actually want to go out there with the goal, and I believe she's in um, New Zealand right now, so they do have slightly higher payouts, but if you want to do this for real, you can make some money. Uh, it's way better than uh, finding Pokemon, Brad. Yeah, was, right. yeah really? All right. So uh, I, I want let's talk about the other half of the equation here because we've talked about how you were able to get your expenses down to uh, 18, 
thousand, roughly eighteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, somewhere in that range. And but and you did this in the context of leaving a job where you were making, I believe, starting out. And, and you can help walk us through this. But you very like you you have done an amazing job leaving your job and and negotiating much higher salary. So walk us through kind of your your what your salary was starting out and how you were able to increase that over time. Sure. So out of college, I started making $35,000 and that was in 2011. And then I quit my job after a year. The dream without job. Without anything. Go ahead. Is this the dream job to clarify? No, this was definitely not the dream job. <laughs> um, this was the, oh no, no one's hiring. I need a job. Yep. Uh, apply everywhere. And only one job offer came through. So I guess I'm moving to Manhattan. That was that job. <laughs> wow. On a $35,000 a year salary in Manhattan. Yep. And I was paying um, two Manhattan rents at the time. I was helping my partner out. So that wasn't fun. And we were more of the rice and beans kind of get people then by necessity. A lot of pasta. Anyway, um, after that, so I had quit my job without another one, like a wild woman. But luckily, um, right after my two weeks were up, I was on an elliptical at the gym on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. And I got a call saying I got another job, which was absolutely amazing. Shortest fun employment ever. And that job was for 48K. And then about 10 months later, I was laid off. There's this, there's a lot of layoffs in my life. It's very uh, typical in marketing, unfortunately. And so after that, I got another job and a promotion to 65K. And after that, I stayed at the same company, but moved into that dream job Ooh. for 68 then I decided to quit the dream job to move to Seattle. And that's when I got the job online or I got the job that I applied to online for 85. Let's talk about these, these 20 K jumps that were happening. Yes. Was this all like, I'm very, I'm very much noticing. All right, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. Like, like how is this happening? Because that's what the listing was. Like, just tell us a little bit more about how you were able to kind of progressively go up 20 K at a time. Um, it's what I asked for. <laughs> so I love doing my research. I go on sites like Glassdoor and Indeed.com and I figure out what is the market rate for the position. There were a couple of promotions in there, as I mentioned. So it did seem like there was about a 20K jump based on um, years of experience. So then when I would go into negotiations, that's what I would ask for. And if they said, oh, no, we don't have that or that's inappropriate, I'd be like, well, thank you, but I'm, I'm going to keep looking then. So I didn't take no for an answer basically until I found a job that would give me what I was worth. I wasn't um, just going to take anything that came at me, and that probably was partially because I did have a small emergency fund even after that very first job. Awesome. So I stopped you early, but I didn't want to breeze by that, that the, these increases in pay was not accidental. It was an intentional thing. So this last job that you got, I believe you said you were making 80K. Does your salary negotiation job hopping stop there? It does not. So that was four years ago. Um, so after 85, I was once again laid off. And then I found my current job at about 103. And then the year after I was making 106 and this year 110. So yeah. Okay. So my, my I think what, the, what I, what I want to pause on here and highlight for the audience is whatever you're making now is not where you will be next year, the year out. It doesn't have to be unless you choose that. And what's incredible about your story is you actually took action on this. And there's kind of like the, the thought process makes, makes sense to me. And I realize industries are different, but you having that little bit of emergency fund, having a plan, always, you know, knowing what you are worth and then asking for what you're worth was, was a really, really big piece of this. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to ask about, so I know you said in your line of work that layoffs are fairly common, but for a lot of people, when they're laid off, they feel like when it comes time to find that next job, they're on their, you know, back on their heels. Like they're at a disadvantage because how do I explain away why I was laid off? I know I've seen that in, in my own industry. And I'm curious, did that ever cross your mind or is it so common in marketing that it, that it's, that's a non-issue? And like, what was the, the self-talk that you had about, okay, I was laid off. I imagine that's going to come up in my interview. How do, how do I talk through that or what do I think about it? 
It is very normal in marketing. So luckily I didn't get many questions about it. We are at the whim of our clients' budgets. So if we go into a correction or recession, it is not uncommon for them to slash marketing first. So um, it's pretty normal. The questions at interviews don't even go in depth into why they see, oh, she started a year ago. Last in, first out rule is what we're usually told. So I was the youngest or newest person in my company. And so that's why I was let go. Um, people understand that it's not based on performance or anything I did. However, it does, of course, not feel great <laughs> to suddenly be without a job when that wasn't my choice. So it did put me back on my heels. It always does. But um, I pick myself back up. I give myself affirmations. I remind myself how awesome I am. I reread my LinkedIn recommendations. <laughs> and then I just keep going. Amazing. So I think what we've done in the, in the meantime is we've talked about how you, how you grew the gap. The one thing that didn't happen is your lifestyle doesn't seem like it was inflating with your salary which is its own challenge to work through. Like, oh, I deserve it. I got the raise. I deserve it. Which, you know, maybe to some degree is fine, but I want to point out the freedom that we're talking about that you built for yourself is because that you didn't buy into that. And I want to now address the gap and, and how the gap has grown. So when your journey starts and you make this plan to tackle financial independence and this audacious goal of achieving this at the age of 30 or 35, depending on whatever your mindset was there, what was your net worth at that point in time? When I decided to pursue financial independence, it was 50K that was all squirreled away in my 401k plan. So I actually didn't know I had that money. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, so you had no idea it was even there? Nope. I hadn't paid attention to it. I put a percentage in and walked away. <laughs> wow. That's wild. So how did you know, like when you first started that, that initial job, how did you know what percentage to put away? Like a lot of people at 22 aren't thinking about retirement. Was that something that I know it sounds like, and we'll talk about this, that sounds like you were third generation Phi, right? Mm -hmm. Was that something that your mom told you? Was it something that a coworker, HR rep, like how, how did that even come onto your radar screen? My mom told me to do it. And she sent me to talk to her financial advisor who actually did not give me great advice, but did give partial good advice in that he got me investing in it, even if it was not ideal plans. So that's how I did it. Um, I just listened to her and I kept going. So this is the year, is this 2013 or 2015 that you realize you have 50 K sitting in the bank? 2015. So in the year 2015, your net worth was $50,000. I'll be at stored away in 401 K vehicles. So walk us through how you don't need to tie it to the job, but just walk us through how your net worth has grown over the years. How long did it take you to get from 50 K to hundred K? Five years, I believe. Well, total from, let me back up. From the 50K, it took me about two years to get to 100K. But from getting out of college, it took me five. Five years. So it took you five years to get that first 100K saved up. And then take us from that point on to now, knowing what we know about where you kept your, what you kept your life, your life expenses at and what you did with your salary. How long did it take you to get to where you are now? And where are you now? Right now, as of last night, I'm at 420. <laughs> wow. And um, that's obviously what we're talking in 2019. But I went from 50K to 90K in 2015 and then to 140K 2016 to 30K in 2017. And then last year, obviously, we had a little bit of a correction. So I ended at 280 and then currently sitting at 420. So Brad, I think probably what's coming through is that although you are contributing, I'd actually be interested how much you are contributing, but the market is doing a lot of this work for you once you get past that 100K. It is. I'm writing a post about that actually. Nice. And that will certainly be live by the time this podcast airs. So we'll have it linked up in the show notes. And do you have a sense? So I guess your last salary you said was 110,000 and your spending is roughly 20, right? So Correct. you're literally saving roughly $90,000 a year? No, I'm actually only saving 68 um, because of taxes. Of course. The CPA screws up the uh, taxes. <laughs> I was like, listen to wow. me. I was like, wait a second. Wait, you're, In what world does the yeah, account not thinking yeah. about taxes? Oh my God. Wow. That might be the stupidest comment wait, wait, I've ever wait, made on the no, podcast. No, it's okay, Brad. Everybody on. needs to know no, you're no, human. No. It's completely fine. <laughs> uh, let's, let's actually circle back to that. I want to talk about the moment when you go to your HR department or to the accounting department at your, at your employer. Hopefully there's a better accountant than me on there. <laughs> you're fine. We'll give you, we'll give you a pass. 
ass here. Uh, but no, you you say, I, I want to, like, I mean, just walk me through, there's not very many people at your age that are coming in and that aggressively wanting to front load all of their, you know, tax advantage buckets. Walk me through that conversation. Oh, it's always an awkward one. Um, I always get strange looks. When I first started at this company, it was in November of 2016. And I filled out my 401k form saying that I wanted them to put in 62% of my salary into my 401k. And I got a response. Did you forget a decimal point? (laughs) Which I did not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, a purple life is known to HR. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely am. They fear me. But um, no, it's always awkward. I always get those strange looks because I am quite vocal at work about trying to get my coworkers involved in the 401k plans to try and get them to get the match that we now have um, to invest in traditional IRAs if they can to even think about retirement. I get a lot of eye rolls. But then when we do have a 401k advisor come to talk to us, people keep coming to me afterwards or sending me texts, asking me questions. So I feel like maybe I'm getting to them, (laughs) maybe one day. So talk me through, so obviously you're maxing out the 401k. What other type of advantage vehicles are you contributing to? I'm also contributing to a Roth IRA. I sadly am over the limit for traditional IRAs now. Um, But uh, that I'm doing the 401k, the Roth IRA and taxable accounts. Now, this is actually interesting because you're going to retire next year. In fact, you've said that you've stated a goal, you've committed to it publicly, albeit anonymously. I'm just curious, what is this starting to seep back to your employer or to your coworkers? Are you able to put that hard partition down? And you know, what is it going to be like actually following through on this and walking away from your current job? We shall see. Um, A few of my coworkers who are close friends do know about this goal, but otherwise uh, no one has come close to outing me. It's actually not uncommon in Seattle to have a black woman such as myself with purple hair. (laughs) So I can blend into the crowd a little bit. (laughs) And so far no one's told me, oh, I saw you on the Wall Street Journal. What's going on? Nothing like that. So still anonymous over here. Um, As for how it will be, I think it'll be pretty stereotypical. I am debating if I will say, hey, boss, I'm retiring. Yes, I'm 30. Don't worry about it. Bye. Or I'm going to take some time. You know, I'm going to just leave this job and go traveling. So I need to decide how I'm going to spin it. But it should be interesting regardless. All right. I have so many questions. When you, <laughs> I'm competing with Brad for yeah, questions. Yeah, really. Who would have guessed? <laughs> Who would have guessed? So... All right. Obviously, we're talking a, a small budget in the grand scheme of things, right? Eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. I'm even thinking like this job spotter. If you if you earn fifty dollars <laughs> a day, that covers your entire yearly expenses. Are you planning on earning income in this early retirement? Or talk us through like what you're thinking about income wise, and also pulling out of really your net worth here. Like how does how does that look? Is it going to come out of taxable accounts? until you do, let's say, the Roth IRA conversion ladder. like Talk me through what your plans are for this post-retirement life. Sure. I'm not currently planning to make any income, just as a baseline. Uh, So my numbers, my calculations work without it, just because I do have that flexibility. I mentioned uh, no house, no car, no kids. Um, I am planning to move quite often, maybe every three months or so with my partner. So if the market tanks and I want to spend less, that might just involve Mexico instead of Ireland, for example. Um, So that's one way I'm going to pull that trigger. I'm, of course, not averse to making money if I need to. Um, if things aren't working out as planned, but that's not something that I assume I will be doing. Though you make a good point, maybe job spotter because I will have more time and I do love walking. (laughs) They pay well in Uh, New Zealand, I hear. You might become the brand ambassador. I mean. (laughs) (laughs) I'd be open to it. (laughs) And then to answer your other question, how I'm planning to do this, um, pretty stereotypical. I am planning to have my taxable dividends, which will be about 5K, just auto deposited into my account. And then for the rest of it, I will be taking... um, selling some stocks to get long-term capital gains out of, once again, my taxable account until my Roth conversion ladder reaches a little over five years that I can take out enough um, to sustain myself. So that's the main plan. But of course, if I do make additional money, might not even need to do all that. I suspect for you at this point in your journey, social security is not really something that is being factored in 
to your you know early retirement plan. Is that fair? That's correct. I'm not including the numbers, assuming I get none of it, but I will have the 40 credits, so I will be eligible for Social Security. So you and your partner are on this path clearly together, but I know in reading your blog, you have not combined your finances. And I'm curious to hear what his plans are and and how the interplay of this works in this early retirement together. So yes, you're correct. We don't combine our finances for a couple of reasons. We're actually not legally bound to each other. We're not married and we're not going to get married. So that's part of it. Um, But also we just find it very, we find it easier not to combine finances. Even though it might require a little bit of work, we have a spreadsheet. If I pay rent, I just tell him on the spreadsheet and then it's fine. Um, It all evens out in the end. But um, I, in doing thought experiments, think that I might become a little resentful or uncomfortable just because we are two different people and we have different goals. So if he's telling me like he just did, he spent hundreds of dollars on a PS4 to play one game. And I think, Oh, is that really worth however many hours of work that I need to go to buy that PS4 and everything else? Um, I might get a little resentful. So we just find it a lot easier to think of each of our money as our money. And then obviously we combine it to pay for rent and all that stuff. But otherwise we have complete control over our own money. You have a lot of flexibility here because some of the trappings that you said, you know, I don't have the house, I don't have the car, we don't have kids, don't have pets. So, but I'm curious when you, when you actually leave your job and you're now in the process of drawing down and I I only put my, I put this into perspective from someone listening to this, that's hearing this number that is the 25 rule. So the, you know, the, the 4% rule, the inverse of that being 25 times your annual expenses, you said 18,000, $18,000 a year in expenses, multiply that times 25. That gives you 450 K is what you need to text to technically meet that. It sounds like you have a goal of 500,000. So you've actually added like a 10% buffer on top of that, which seems reasonable. I'm curious, let's say you quit your job. However, that gets framed. And then the next day the market goes down or, or you're planning on leaving the job and like two months before you leave the market corrects by 40%, 40%. How does that, <laughs> how does that change your plan? And, and how do you have flexibility built into this plan? Cause I think that's one thing that someone that's doing a mathematical analysis of this would say, well, okay, it works theoretically if we keep doing this for a while, but sequence of the sequence of return risk, right? Mm -hmm. So if the market tanks two months before I'm planning to quit, um, I will still quit. And luckily, I won't actually need to withdraw any money for about, well, that would be 14 months because I'll already have the cash I require for my first year of whatever that may be. I guess it would be more of a sabbatical given that situation. (laughs) Um, So I'm trying to remember, I think most downturns take one to two years. So I might actually be all good by the time I need to take money out. We shall see. Yeah, I know this is really interesting. And 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 the more contrarian people out there, and, and I want you to hear me. I don't really I, I tend to be the eternal optimist, and I'm more really more on your side of this than this question is gonna really sound. But let's just say for the for the people out there that the glass is half empty, it couldn't possibly work because you've had to go through this thought experiment. You're doing this, you're actually doing this. Let's say the market stays down for two years. The market stays down for three years. You have one year of expenses, but the market's still down 40% two or three years later. Like, does your plan still work then? Mathematically, I guess we'll have to see. But my my plan of that kind of situation would be, oh, I get to a year after I quit and I realize I need to get my next year's money. So then that would be one of the unfortunate situations where, oh, look, it's not really working out. I guess I need to make a little bit of money. And luckily, since my expenses are relatively low, I could go back to my very first entry-level marketing job if needed, and I could still pay all my bills. I love it. Yeah, that is the beauty of flexibility and keeping a lean lifestyle, right? You have options, and they are plentiful, right? If you're making $110,000 in your job now, and clearly you have skills that are in demand, it's not too hard to imagine you earning $20,000 a year to cover your expenses. So yeah, I applaud you. That's brilliant. (laughs) You're going to be just fine. You're going to crush it. (laughs) I wanted to run through that experiment for someone else, not for you. Yeah, I don't think she's worried about that. I don't think you're worried. (laughs) All right, so let's play this out though. I think the next thing is, but what are you going to retire to? What are your thoughts there? Mm -hmm. 
So I was a contrarian myself in this way because I used to think me personally, I don't need something to retire to because I saw my mom who actually did not retire quote unquote to something. She did mostly retire from her job. But unfortunately, now that I'm an active member of this community, you guys have tricked me and I already have this blog going. I'm talking to you guys like I've got a whole new life going here. I'm going to FinCon next year. Um, I want to visit all of my new five friends. So I'm retiring to the Fi community. Oh, wow. Oh, there it is. <laughs> did we did we miss anything, Brad? I feel like we have done our best, right? Yeah. No, this is a wild. Ju- this is really just an amazing story. I, I did want to talk really quickly about third generation Fi, right? So you said your mom retired at 55. Your grandma, I believe you said at 50. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like, these were overt decisions. I'd love for you to, to talk us through that, talk us through any lessons they passed along and, and how that's impacted your life today. So my grandparents did retire at 50 and they did that on a military pension. So that's obviously a lot more stable than what we're doing, a lot more uh, reliable than the stock market. So they left their jobs and were able to really help my mom raise me, which was amazing. And which is what I grew up with and seeing my grandma have that freedom to come help me when needed, go to my cousin if my aunt was sick and really help her family out, which is what she loved to do. And then my mom did retire at 55 and she has been basically chilling and recovering from three decades of work since then. And the lessons that they taught me were really overall frugality, which there was actually a time in New York that I did not listen to. But <laughs> overall, it was always in the back of my mind to really think about, is this worth that amount of money. And if it is, then totally go for it. For example, my mom loves lavish vacations and she spends on them. She doesn't really care about shoes or clothes or anything like that. So then she just squirrels her money away and goes on these wild times. So um, that's really what they instilled in me. And then just generally having an open conversation about money, that's always been something that's been talked about in our household, which is really helpful. You know, I want to circle back. You said that one of the things you're retiring to is to the Fi community and also to a purplelife.com. This is something that's really become a passion. It's become part of your identity. And I'm curious, like, I, I you know, why you, I, I feel like there's this stereotype and I think it's, I think it's untrue, increasingly untrue, but the stereotype of the Fi community is represented by white male in software engineers. And I'm just curious as one of the, you know, your story is so different in so many different ways. Was that one of the reasons that you decided to to share it on a purple a purplelife.com? That's exactly it. Um, not just that I was slightly different so that I can show, oh no, this is inclusive. Like everyone's welcome. This isn't just for white male programmers. Come on in. Um, but also that radical transparency you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I find numbers and real tangible information extremely helpful on this journey. And so I wanted to provide another example of that for people. Well, I, you know, on behalf of the Fi community, I think people crave numbers like the ones that you're sharing and the steps that you you've taken. You know, you may need to iterate them for your own individual life, your own individual situation, but I think it's replicable. And I I love that you were willing to share this with us. On most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But uh, purple on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. All right, purple. What is your favorite blog, podcast, or book of all time? My favorite blog is Millennial Revolution because they were a huge influence on me. And when I decided to take my blog public, they were the first blog I saw that not only said, nope, we're going to post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So then I got excited, even though it was weekdays (laughs) to hear what they had to say. And then also they were so real and weird and they (laughs) didn't sugarcoat anything and they made strange jokes and I was laughing while learning about investments and I just loved it. So I thought, okay, yeah, I can put my own weird thoughts out there. It'll be fine. (laughs) Bryce is very strange. (laughs) In the best possible way. (laughs) And I would say that Christy balances them out, but I think she just like takes it into overdrive. (laughs) Love them. All right. uh, Question number two, an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful. I think it would be getting that dream job and realizing it wasn't all it was cracked up to be, Um, which is obviously what made me think about, well, I'm not doing anything with this extra money. I'm 
currently putting it in savings. What's the harm? I'll just open a traditional IRA. Let's see what happens. And then suddenly realizing the kind of freedom that achieving FI in my 30s would grant me and going for it. So with this dream job, how quickly did you realize that this was not the end all be all? Like what what does that look like? And and how quickly did you come to that realization? It took about six months and I realized with that job, one of the reasons I was able to come to that conclusion is because it was my first job where I wasn't working basically 24-7. I had time to think and not just come home and pass out and start all over again. Um, But it was that reflection time that made me realize, no, this job really does have everything I want, and I still don't want to do it for another 50 years. All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. Travel hacking for sure. Travel rewards rather. Um, they have been they have been really helpful in that. As I mentioned, my mom likes luxury vacations. So t- <laughs> when I tried to reconcile how I could go on them with her, with my budget, travel rewards really saved me in that regard. That's cool. Tell us about about your best redemption or just an especially fun one. Um, we we just booked it. It's the Etihad Apartments for sixteen thousand dollars. Oh wow. Wow. So an apartment, tell, tell the audience, I know about this, but tell the audience what, what this looks like. So Etihad has first class apartments, which basically involves a couch that turns into a bed and a lounger and this little, it's almost, I'm going to say as big as part of my Manhattan studio. <laughs> it's <laughs> significant and it's all mine in the sky and I'm very excited. <laughs> oh, that is incredible. For someone, I am literally flying Delta basic economy later today. And I'm not sure that I, I don't even have a seat assigned. So yeah, the thought of flying in an apartment in the sky, I mean, that's what travel rewards can do. Take the seat that you're going to be on later on today and put it in the lavatory on the apartment that she has, her own personal (laughs) lavatory on this, on this larger Uh, plane. (laughs) Or the shower. I actually don't have my own bathroom. I know you're joking, but (laughs) don't have my own bathroom, but the bathroom does have a shower and I haven't taken a shower in the sky since Emirates. And I'm also excited about that. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Very, very cool. Uh, Question number four, the biggest financial mistake that you've made. Ooh, I think it's. I think, or you can say, I've never yeah. made a financial mistake. <laughs> I'm perfect. No, um, <laughs> I think it's not taking what my mom said very seriously out of college. As in, I talked to her advisor, he put me in subpar funds, and then I just let it ride for years. I didn't take a moment to teach myself about investing at all. I didn't start reading any books or blogs about investing until I started down my path to FI. So I have resisted calculating the amount of money I've quote unquote lost by not doing that and just having those high expense ratio loads on my 401k. Yeah, don't do it. Just move forward. Okay. (laughs) Sounds good. All All right. Question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Don't listen to other people and their ideas of what will make you happy. Figure out what makes you happy and go after that. All right. And we do have a bonus question for you. Uh, What purchase have you made over the past 12 months that has added the most value to your life? It does not sound like it's a PS4. Unfortunately, no. Though I have really enjoyed the Nintendo Switch. So we didn't buy that in the last year. Um, It's actually going to have to be slim fit earplugs. Interesting. Do you guys know about this? No, no. First time I'm hearing about it. So I did not even think about it, but apparently people's ear canals are different sizes. <laughs> and I apparently have small ears. So I always thought earplugs were like a very painful device that people used out of necessity. And I background suck at sleeping. So like the slightest noise, I wake up and I sometimes can't go back to sleep. Um, and so I thought, well, this is just my life. I have a fan and a noisemaker and I can't sleep and I wake up at the slightest noise and that's that. And the alternative is having really, really painful earplugs in. Apparently not. They make earplugs for smaller ears and it's game changer. Oh my goodness. So the old Apple ear ear pods or whatever they used to be called back in the day, those used to fit like really, really well. And then when they switched over to the new ones, I can't wear them. Like they, they cause me extreme levels of pain. And oh, no. I had no, and I just stopped wearing them. I just looked for cheap alternatives, uh, even though they make a superior device in every other way in terms of uh, 
yeah. I, and so I, I had no idea that, that there were other people with small ear canals just like me. <laughs> <laughs> we need to start a little group. Uh, that's fine. So, oh, okay, I've got to follow up about this. Are these readily available just if you Google it or on Amazon? Because undoubtedly yes. there are people out there that have been suffering in silence here and they didn't realize. <laughs> Yes, uh, I've bought them on Amazon. I think I got a giant pack for twenty bucks. Just Google or Amazon search "slim fit earplugs." A giant pack, very nice. Okay, well, mm. we'll have that. We will have that documented. Thank you so much for coming on the show. So, purple people listening to this, they want to find out more about your story. They want to connect with you. They just want to follow you on this journey. What is the best way for them to do that? Come find me at a purplelife.com. I've got all my social media on there in case you want to look at random photos of keto food on my Instagram or chat on Twitter. <laughs> Hit me up. Purple, thanks so much for joining us on the show. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for having me.